you see us on there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure the camera's catching us yet. No, you're right. All right, here we go. Welcome, everyone. I call the October 3rd oh, yeah, Planning Commission meeting to order. The main purposes of tonight's meeting are to conduct a study session on this human service, economic development, urban design, cultural and historic resources, parks and recreation, natural environment, shoreline, climate, capital, city, capital facilities, utilities and implementation elements and associated development regulation elements. Before we move on to agenda items, I'd like to acknowledge our hybrid meeting format. City of Bothell is providing the option to attend this meeting either in person or remotely via Zoom. Those who are participating via Zoom, the chat and question functions are not available to ensure compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act. We have a public comment agenda item at the beginning of the meeting. This time is for comments on issues not scheduled for hearing on tonight's agenda. Please limit these comments to three minutes. Please note that the City of Bothell does not tolerate verbal harassment. Please remember this during your comments. Public comment will be allowed both in person and via Zoom. Those wishing to comment via Zoom were asked to submit an online form by 3 p.m. today. And I don't believe we received any for Zoom, correct? We received a written comment. Correct, we received one written comment which was yes. distributed to the commission. Yes, email was encouraged as well. And as uh, Deputy Director Gates indicated, we did receive one which was circulated to the commissioners. Those in attendance may also make comments and have been asked to indicate the desire to comment on the sign-in sheet. The Imagine Bothell Notice, City website, and tonight's agenda all provided information to the public for providing comments. A video of this meeting will be streamed live, as well as recorded and available for later viewing on the City's YouTube channel. A call-in number was provided on the meeting agenda for members of the public who wish to call in by phone and listen live to the meeting. For our call-in phone-in callers, during staff presentations, staff will make every effort to specify which materials they are referencing so that everyone can follow along. At this point, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the attendance of the commissioners. Commissioner Jones? Here. Commissioner Westerbeck? Here. Commissioner Lever? Here. Commissioner Robson? Here. I see you. Commissioner Sills? Here. Okay. And Commissioner Gustafson? Here. Thank you. So all commissioners are present. In addition, uh, Deputy Director Gates, Jesse Hartman from Burke Consulting are in attendance, and Transportation, Riyad, Transportation Supervisor Riyad Tirhi from Public Works Department is also in attendance. <clears throat> Lastly, before we begin, I'd like to reiterate some meeting guidelines. For all meeting attendees, please speak clearly and pause frequently. State your name each time before speaking. Mute your microphone when not speaking. If you are also streaming the live video feed, please turn off the sound as there is a delay. For the commissioners, at specific breaks in the presentation, I'll be calling on members who wish to speak or ask a question. If you want to speak, please indicate this by raising your hand. I will call you as soon as I see you. This will help avoid the problem of two people speaking at the same time. Identify yourself before you ask a question, make a motion, second a motion, or participate in debate, and please mute your microphone when not speaking. The first item on the agenda is public comment. The city has accepted visitor comment in writing as well as accepted sign-up sheets for those who wish to speak at tonight's meeting. Those speaking will have three minutes. Written comments submitted to staff no later than 3 p.m. were forwarded to all commissioners and are part of the record. This time is for items not on tonight's agenda. We did receive one comment by email which was forwarded to all commissioners. Please let us know if any comments were received other than the one I acknowledged. Seeing none, if there are any Zoom commenters, we'll call on them one at a time for comments up to three minutes. Do we have anyone in the audience who would like to comment? Okay, please step up to the podium. And you'll have three minutes once you start. I want everybody who is a member of uh, BOPOP uh, to recuse themselves from working on the comprehensive plan. And that includes the comprehensive plan working group. It's my understanding of three of them are BOPOP members. And uh, in the past years, 
Four out of the seven city council members were BOPOP members. Five out of the seven planning commissioners were BOPOP members, which means we don't have a quorum in any body because of the conflicts of interest between the urban densification proponents of BOPOP, which goes explicitly 180 degrees from our comprehensive plan. Now, I've got a few things here tonight. I've got a long list. I only got three minutes. Glad to see, you. Kevin, you finally got the bylaws straight, so I can't speak for longer than that. Uh, kind of uh, tyrannical, if you ask me. Back in the day, Pop Keeney to the river was supposed to be all parking on Highway 527. That was the promise. 527 wasn't supposed to go through to 522. It wasn't supposed to go down the river. I've got pictures at home. I could bring them in. I might email them in to you. The Alexan was supposed to be an anchor retail shop with parking. So they're supposed to be parking on 527 all the way from Alyssa Burnett Burn Center all the way down to the river. What happened to that? Bait and switch. UW Bothell, which we invited into our community, single family residents, I might add, they were concerned about UW, UW Bothell becoming a residential college, and we were assured wasn't going to be a residential place. We weren't going to have any campus housing here. Bait and switch. The Alexan originally was proposed to be open space for the public. And then they changed that. It was supposed to be anchor retail. And get this, with parking. But there wasn't supposed to be anybody living or commuting in and out of that place. It was supposed to close. No traffic. These are all broken promises. I moved to Bothell in 1991. I got a string of them here. I'm not gonna be able to get through all of them, so I'm gonna to have to come back. The crow problem. The crow problem. It's a sign of ecosystem disruption. I haven't seen a robin on West Hill for two years because crows eat bird eggs, period. UW Bothell can't explain it. HB 1110 stipulates, use the Office of Financial Management for your population Thank you, your three minutes is up. I got a lot more here, people. A lot of broken promises. Thank you. You mean that, Kevin? Yes, I do. I Thank you for you your did. comments. You would have given me an extra three or four minutes if you did. No, I'm rather even-handed in that. No, enforcing that. Yeah. Um, moving on, uh, moving on, uh, are there any other commenters? Okay, thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is approval of the September 18th minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Don't listen to these people. This is Commissioner Jones. I move to approve the minutes. Okay, there's a motion to approve. Is there a second? I second the motion. Mr. Westerbeck seconds. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the minutes. Any discussion? Commissioner Gustafson. Hello, Sarah Gustafson here. Thank you. I do wonder if the current agenda has the correct link, the correct Zoom link on it. I think there might be some error there or confusion there. So I was wondering if we could clear that up. I know it's not technically part of the minutes, but it's what we look at right as we look at the minutes. Thank you. Uh, so I'll ask staff to take a look at that. Uh, if it takes more time, perhaps you can bring it back to us. Is that the way you should go on that? Yeah, we can we can take a look and make sure it's got the right link on the on the minutes. Okay. So um, Hearing that, we'll probably defer adoption, but are there any other comments on the minutes? Seeing none, G given that there is an open question, I'm going to suggest that we defer adoption of the minutes. I don't know, does that require a motion? It's a motion on the floor. I guess we could 
vote no on adoption and bring it back might be the way to go. That's that's not on my little step by step uh, table motion. For the next meeting. Yeah. Table for the next meeting. Okay. So is there a motion to table for the next meeting? All right. Oh, I, I move we table, Commissioner Westerbeck here, we move we table the, uh, mini, sorry, the, what do we call it? Adoption of the minutes. Adoption of the minutes until the next meeting when we can clarify the link problem. Commissioner Gustafson, did you want to weigh in? I thought I saw you. Chair Gustafson here, that sounds great. Thank you, okay. everybody. Is that a second? Okay. All right, all in favor of tabling? Aye. 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 All right, we'll Aye. table the minutes, adoption of the, uh, um, September 18th minutes to the next meeting pending a review of the link that is in the minutes to verify or modify as appropriate. Thank you for pointing that out. <clears throat> Moving on to our uh, primary agenda item, the study session on the Bo Imagine Bothell Comprehensive Plan. Um, I'd like to kick this off. Deputy Director Gates. Yeah, let me just pull up my screen here. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, glad to be back. We are here tonight to talk about the final uh, final review of the revised uh, comprehensive plan elements, those listed uh, at the introduction of the meeting, and then step into the development regulations that are associated with the the comp plan update, uh, primarily the land use update, but um, comp plan update that that uh, both have to be adopted by the end of this year. So I'm going to run through um, run through both both sections. Make sure we get uh, everyone's feedback, which is what we're looking for: feedback on the revised uh, remaining elements as well as those zoning regulations. Um, just a quick reminder to reset ourselves, make sure we know where we are in the process. We're, at, we're moving towards the final adoption, uh, final plan and EIS, uh, and then the final sub-area plans, uh, as, long as, as well as the final development regulations. So all, all, all three kind of coming together here towards the end, and we'll be back uh, October 16th to to review the input that we received tonight on development regulations, uh, clarify any, any remaining questions that may be out there, uh, and then we'll move towards a public hearing in, in November. Um, so tonight, uh, just, just looking at the, the remaining uh, really 11 elements, we've, we've talked about transportation element early September, land use and housing came to you last meeting on the, on the 18th. And so now we just want to make sure that we've captured um, and clarified either answered any questions, clarified any any questions on the on the policy changes or poli really policy additions that were included. Uh, I ran through those in the staff memo as far as which which elements received um, new uh, new policies. Uh, trying to link those to the organization. Typically, it's, they were they're all based on based from organizations. Some were community comments, uh, some were comments from those on, on Planning Commission or Council, uh, which led to the change from the, the April, uh, April draft. Um, so that's really what I want to do real quick here uh, and, and spend the bulk of our time on the development regulations where we can, we can get into the weeds on, on those questions. So these, these updates uh, were, were very uh, minimal uh, in regard to the number of, of pages and, and how much work has gone into it. Uh, I think it shows how much those that came well before me uh, and, and, and Jesse here to my, to my right, the work that Burke has done to make sure they captured what the community was looking for in, in the future plan for Bothell with the, the development of these elements. The, the couple additions uh, I, I do want to just point out, um, NUSA, they, they commented on a number of, of, of aspects focusing, uh, as you would expect, on, on housing and human services, um, adding some, some increased uh, 
item increasing uh, focus on services for elder um, elder care and supporting aging in place um, very little on urban design uh, really there were there were a lot of comments we received which is typical from Washington Fish and Wildlife Department of Fish and Wildlife um, on on the environmental on the national environment chapter um, really focusing on removing or, or establishing policies that try to try to get development out of floodplains and, and flood prone areas um, as and then greenhouse gases and, and a discussion on greenhouse gas emissions in the revised draft those came from um, a few members in the community uh, as well as from PSRC to make sure we expanded upon that and, and, and hit those hit those points um, I, I wanted to just make sure and, and open up the floor before we kind of move into the development regulations because it's it's much it, it's so much of a, a different animal uh, if there are any questions on the draft that was provided um, if we can clarify anything if we can expand upon anything um, we'd like to, to offer that up now Commissioners, any comments or questions? Clarification. Sorry, were you talking about uh, on the in, in the comp plan itself? Not before we get to the development regulation discussion. Okay. Correct. Thanks, sir. Was wanted to clarify. I thought I missed that. I, I've got a, a few things, mostly minor, perhaps clarifications. First thing I'd like to say is. Uh, I noted in a number of places there were uh, additions based on tribal, tribal government input, so uh, that was nice to see. Um, a little surprised in the human services, 25 to 30 different organizations, seemed like a big number. <laughs> just, just an observation, I don't know if there's anything there. Um, in economic development, it wasn't clear to me when you talked about UW Bothell, if it included Cascadia, I don't know if I missed it or are they separate entities or yeah. When I looked, I'm not sure I saw Cascadia. Now it's quite possible I missed it, but and yeah, economic development. Um, Jesse Hartman, uh, it. In the, are you speaking to the policies? Or are you speaking to the the in kind the of, body of the plan? In the the kind of introductory pieces yeah. to the economic development. Yeah, because they're definitely in the policies. Um, we'll take another look and make sure that that. Okay, that and again, it's quite possible I missed mm -hmm. it. Um, in urban policy, there was uh, talk, and I think it was policy UD eight about various amenities and things to make it more uh, user-friendly. I'd like to suggest we consider restroom facilities as well. Um, when I travel in different cities, that's really something that makes a difference, availability of restrooms. So. <coughs> um, I'd say maybe UDP8 might be a place to look at it. Uh, it lists a number of things like garbage cans and different, you know, amenities uh, you know maybe it would go somewhere else but when I look at a, a more inviting place to be that's and maybe it's just me getting a bit older here but uh, I, I find it when I travel it's something that I notice so um, when you look at climate Disaster debris management is, is a big thing. I didn't see that specifically called out. I believe the primary responsibility for that would lie with King County uh, as the former division director at King County Solid Waste. But I do know that the cities are sometimes called upon to provide uh, disaster debris storage sites. You know, when you get a big one, it's got to go somewhere before it goes away. So you might think about that and see whether you need to reach out. And also along those lines in my previous life on utilities, I think it might be worth sticking in the term of the Recology contract. Recology is a current service provider. Uh, I believe this plan will outlive the term of the current contract. Uh, just recognizing that I think uh, has some value. And I love that in implementation on LUF, we talk about parking enforcement. <laughs> those were my nits to pick. Anyone else? 
else? Commissioner Westerback. Commissioner Westerback, this is more of a comment and a, a thank you. Um, I raced to, to put very vague comments in as a public person or a resident <laughs> last spring, and I, I did not do the work of calling out the, the specific item as you have requested when you were asking for feedback from the public. So my bad on that, I was very vague, but I did have very strong opinions and I'm sure you read them and they came through in some of the packets. But I wanna thank you for putting in the analysis from Urban 3. Um, and I also part of that was my sneaky way of trying to get some of the new staff to rec recognize that we had that on the shelf. And um, I think it could be really important and, um, and I'm glad it's in the comp plans. We can refer to it um, and use it as a tool. I know the mayor and a couple of council members had talked about uh, perhaps uh, getting more urban three to, to continue some of their work and do some more analysis for us in the future. So anyway, I think it's really important because they're showing us, you guys are probably familiar with their work. I'm probably, you know, telling you something you already know, but I think the data is really powerful and shows us a, a way that uh, a way forward to help pay our bills and create hopefully a, a more, um, you know, useful city for everyone. So anyway, it's great to see that there. I appreciate it. Thank you. Other commissioner comments or feedback? All right, well, thank you for the uh, very hard work done on this. It's quite an impressive document with uh, clearly a lot of work in it. So thank you. Daunting. <laughs> I looked at 356 pages and <laughs> was concerned. All right, so <laughs> proceeding on. All right, uh, so real quick before I move on to the next slide, final draft. So we'll, we're going to, we'll be heading back to city council next week to have the same conversation, uh, make sure we get any, any last comments, clarifications from them. And then that final draft will be produced uh, along with the final EIS. And then we'll, we'll move towards adoption. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss kind of how those next steps look um, as the weeks go on. The bigger thing to talk about tonight uh, is, are, the, are the edits, uh, amendments that are necessary to the Botham Municipal Code as it relates to uh, the zoning designation changes, the dimensional standards, and uh, just some, gener some general devel development regulations. W the majority of the items that we'll talk about tonight have to be included this year because they tie directly to the future land use map and the work of establishing those capacities. Uh, I'm going to run through a few tables and feel free to stop me at any point. Uh, these are all based on, and I included some of these um, uh, on the table here for the commissioners, pulling from page 354 through 357 of the, of the packet, so the, the very end of the packet where there's a lot of information about uh, the lot size, density, height, um, the, the site coverage, sometimes called lot coverage, sometimes called maximum impervious surface, uh, as well as some discussion on some of the overlays. Um, so that's where that's where a lot of the discussion is going to, to sit. Um, and I first wanna look through uh, just the, the overall zoning designation changes, uh, zoning updates that link to the future land use map. I tried to color coordinate this to match the future land use map, which I do have on a later slide. Um, the lighter colored are those that are the very minimal, um, very small or large lot size, low density, um, residential low uh, aligns with the residential low um, future land use code, or f future land use map code uh, onto medium density, and then I, I did keep that residential uh, manufactured home in there as well. These, uh, this is, this information is found on page 236 of the packet, uh, which is part of what's what's in front of you tonight on the on the table. Looking at all of the kind of code cleanup and work that we could do, we could just keep going. It's sort of a never ending process where we could look to revise names, clarify a few things here. You start working on a portion of it and you realize, oh, it would be really nice if we clarified this, not changing any of the intent, just kind of consolidating some things. What we're looking to do uh, as part of sort of two phases, phase one is this year, and that is solely 
associated with these residential designations. So the table represents how we went from the R40,000, 9,600, and, and so on and so forth, to the new zoning designation assignments. So splitting those, splitting those up or sometimes combining them. Um, the R40,000, the, the name is the only thing that changes there. Uh, so the, the future land use code on the, on the right is RC, residential conservation. We are just changing the name and, and moving away from that, that square footage, that minimum lot size um, sort of um, moniker uh, and, and shifting away to something a little more straightforward that doesn't necessarily link to a, a specific, it doesn't directly link to a, a, a lot size and then, and then we, we're faced with this step in the future. So um, RL1 and 2 are those low density RM one through four are the medium, the medium density residential. Uh, the manufactured home park, uh, it's currently an overlay. We are looking to just designate that as a zone type. So the future land use map has the, the underlying comprehensive designation of uh, manufactured home park, and we're just carrying that forward uh, on the zoning. So keeps the same protections. There's a little bit of, of work within the, the zoning code and the kind of how you take an overlay and make it a, 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 a zone, um, but we're not, we're not changing anything there on that, in, that intent. So with this, yes. Commissioner Westerbeck, is the idea there just that um, it makes it more permanent, uh, maybe in, instead of the overlay being a sort of a, this could go away and we might change the zoning and allow uh, non-mobile home kind of like a you're not sort of banking the land anymore yeah it, it, whether you if you if someone looked to remove the overlay it would still go through that same process mm -hmm. of a, a zoning code amendment so sure. it's just not it's a little more solid as, well, as a zoning committed. designation yeah. right and, and that matches directly with the underlying Zoning. I figured it, that was the intent. I just wanted to clarify because that's great. I like it. And it also, you know, where we separated out, if you remember in the future land use map, the fee simple mm -hmm. versus non fee simple right. manu manufactured home parks, this would then kind of clarify those. So some of those non fee simple developments, they do have the future land use map co uh, identification as a residential manufacturer home park, but those that are fee simple, they are identified as RL or, or residential low. Got it. Okay. So they would be given that, that zoning. Um, so they could change technically to um, different housing types because of that? Or no, they, still, they, would, they would still, still they would still have to. Got it. Do Other, this. Otherwise everything would be the same as RL1 or RL2. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Got it. Nuance. Thanks. Yeah. One of the things that we really want to get some some input on tonight has to do with density and dimension. Um, so I'm going to show you. There's two slides here. The second one has has a couple of options. Um, but what was presented within the packet uh, identifies these uh, proposed minimum density and a proposed maximum base density. The, the RC, or 40,000 square foot, it's effectively one, one lot where because most of those have, uh, they're, they're encumbered with, with critical areas with slopes, uh, wetlands, streams, and their associated buffers, the code does allow that maximum base density to be two units. Um, but I don't know, I honestly don't know if there are any R40,000 square foot current zoned lots that are not encumbered and could actually do that. Um, all the other ones, you'll see what the current density is on, on the far right and what that shift is to the maximum. Uh, the question that we have for you tonight is about the RM2, 3, and 4. So if I go back a slide, you'll see the 2, 3, and 4. Those were the R7200s, the R5400s, both that there was an A and a D, uh, and then ARM4 is the 4,000 and 2,800. So 
going from currently in those 8, 10, or 15 as their current maximum units to establishing a proposed minimum density. In order to meet the, the targets that we have planned for, the, the, just the targets, not the capacity, the, the actual targets uh, through the countywide planning policies, we would need to see the assumed development built out at the maximum base. So that's at the 50, 60, and 80 units per acre. Um, for context, I think Block D is 131 units per acre. Um, and we can we can kind of come back next time with, with some more examples so you have a, a visual of, well, what is 50 units per acre? What is 60 units per acre? That we're not really, we don't really have much of a question on that because we have to include those. We have to plan for that. The five-year monitoring will show us if we are on target, um, if our assumptions of sort of a steady growth is actually wrong and we're seeing a, a good clip of growth, we might be okay. But what our question's on is the minimum. So right now the concern is about standalone individual homes that might be zoned in an R2800 that's, that's, that's torn down, but it's a singular lot. So it's a very small site installing a, a redevelopment at 40 units per acre at the minimum saying this is what you've got to build to might be unattainable because it's a small site um, and sort of you can picture lots just just north of us um, right on that right on the edge of downtown that might be a few thousand square feet um, that would be a development of of you know four to six units um, on a I would say a, a postage stamp size lot. The more you could cobble together, it, it makes it a lot easier. You have a lot more wiggle room when it comes to where the buildings place access, parking, stormwater, and those things. So the question tonight on the next slide is, do we, do we keep it with this option one with an established minimum um, that's well above the current max, or do we set the minimum at what the current max is? Now, if we had time, if we had six months, we could study this and we could look to figure out, is there a scale? Is there, an, when you're dealing with a half acre site, a half acre site, building it out at 25 units per acre is not a problem. Um, but we just, we, we don't have time. We're kind of up against that, that wall. Um, and either way, whether whichever option we go forward with, part of the reporting within the first five years is gonna tell us you're on track or you're not, and that's where the state and county policies will, will be reevaluated and we'll, we'll have to adjust. So this is kind of, this is our big question um, for you all tonight, um, what your thoughts might be. I would be happy to jump in, Commissioner Westerbeck. This is literally the pool in which I swim daily you may or may not know. I'm constantly crunching numbers on how to take small lots, particularly in Bothell, but other cities as well, and put more housing on them. It's actually really easy. I swear to God it is. Super easy. I did four units on 2,600 square feet, and it could have been 12. We have to address the elephant in the room. Parking mandates, setbacks, lot coverage, height, and not even height so much, but a little bit, and public and private open space got to memorize because they deal with them constantly these and then in the building code <clears throat> single stair reform which we've got going through uh cities will have the option to go to six stories or not with a single stair just like seattle which you guys are probably well aware of so um those things would literally transform what and who and where people can build overnight there's a lot of a lack of public will or political will probably to do those but doing um Doing these densities, these minimum densities, is easy to walk in the park. I mean, I could do double that. So we just have to address the elephant in the room, which is suburban development standards applied to places we want to be slightly more urban. 
we really just need to leave it up to the developer decide, for example, am I doing studio and one bedrooms for students near UW Bothell and we don't care about parking? Just let the de developer figure it out, which is what now countless cities are moving to. Not that kind of building, but like just let the developer decide. Um, anybody who's developing luxury condos, townhouses, whatever, they're going to give someone a parking spot because they know they can't sell it unless they do. So they, they're not going to throw $5 million at something they can't sell or rent. Um, height, you know, we could go up 5, 10 feet. Um, and I see we're already relaxing that a little bit in some, in some of our, our proposed codes, it looks like. Setbacks are still very suburban. Um, I don't know why we in America are obsessed with side and front and rear setbacks. The places we all vacation, the buildings are built side to side and up to the sidewalk. And then if there's any lot uh, they need to have, you know, kept as a garden, um, they do it in the back. I'm not sure that's going to fly in our single family areas, but if you really want to utilize a site, no front, no side setbacks. Back, at, you know, put a garden in the back. It's way more useful anyway for kids and stuff. Um, and then um, private and public open space this is a really tough one because if you're trying to do, I crunch numbers constantly. If you're trying to actually build a more affordable unit, 60 square feet is what we require. Um, and a lot of times um, these are near parks and people can go to a park if they want to go hang out and read a book in the park or something because it's thousands and thousands of dollars per unit, maybe even more of that, tens of thousands, to provide a balcony, a roof deck, um, something like that. They're nice. We all love them. Don't get me wrong. And, and we should have them and get big, beautiful ones in a lot of cities that have lower construction costs. But we're dealing with reality here. So um, we maybe think about reducing that or, or um, something like that. Um, options or or maybe you know you you um like some some codes you say you got to do one of these five or something like that and let let them figure it out um anyway i just want to say that those densities are not difficult we just have to to uh deal with the roadblocks it's one of the reasons i'm planning commission thanks commissioner lever I just have a clarifying question for Commissioner Webster. Can you go over the last point that you mentioned? Or sure. Just the last one. Which one? Sorry. The uh, so you were talking about the, I actually like missed the, the very last point. I was processing what you said before. Sorry. So you were talking about. Um, the public and private open space. Yes, public. Uh -huh. Can, you, yeah, can yeah. you expand on that, please? Sure, sure. So our code requires, um, <clears throat> I think if I'm not mistaken, you should correct me if I'm wrong. We still have to do an average of 60 square feet of private open space per unit, like in a multifamily building, like an apartment building or something like that. Um, and there's minimum dimensions, I think it has to be four, at least four feet deep. Um, and so you end up with like a you know, four by 15 or something like that. Um, but there can also be, and I say average because, um, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, you can use courtyards, shared courtyards on the roof or, or in between units, whatever, um, for that space as well. It's just why you don't see every apartment with a balcony. Um, or you see a small balcony and, and the balance of it is is um, on a roof deck or something like that. And am I getting this right? I think it's, I think I, it's I right. I need to look into the details yeah. of what, what, it, what the ratio actually is. But. Um, well, I, at least the ones I usually deal with, uh, uh, DC, DN, stuff like that, um, it's 60 square feet per, per unit uh, average. Um, and then, um, then we kind of litigated the, the public open space a few years ago because I recommended uh, before I was on planning commission that it was a burden for small sites because I think that the code was intended, at least I thought the code was intended to make sure a really like huge block size building didn't fill the whole block, kind of like uh, the Alexan is, without providing some um, public open space. And I think the idea was probably like a wonderful courtyard or a piazza or something, which we're not getting. It's not really working, I think, the way we intended, but that was probably the idea. We'd have some public you know, fountain filled courtyards or something like that. Anyway, um, so now I, th I think it's 5,000 square foot lots and smaller don't have to do, well, they have op the option of doing um, public open space, but they don't have to. And again, we have to check numbers on that, but I think it was something in that range. Um, so the bigger projects do. So there's the two kinds, the, the kind that public um, can use. And we have projects all over the, all the, the city that have um, public open space. In fact, my, my project, which is on tiny lot, was still subject to it. And we have this tiny little 300 or 275, something like that, square feet of little green space. Dogs come and pee and poop on it, so that's fun. 
but it's fine. <laughs> um, we plant it. Otherwise, there's the two kinds of, of open space are required. But one's private for us to enjoy as a residence, and it's not where you invite anyone you know, off the street to come enjoy. It's for you personally. It's a balcony or something. And I love them. I put them on my building not only because they're required, but it's just a quality of life thing. But if we're, if we're looking at how do you, you know, build for UW Bothell and Cascadia students or people who are, are looking at just um, um, nice, simple housing, and they're two blocks from Bothell Landing or something like that. Um, you know, maybe there's some room for us to relax those requirements. That's all. Hope that was that was probably more explanation than you asked for, but yeah. Other commissioner comments? Commissioner Jones? This is Commissioner Jones. Um, I know this is a planning session, and I assume that you want feedback on the different options, et cetera. What would help me in terms of providing feedback is one, like you said, to see some illustrations of what some of these things might look like. Um, that would really help just visually. I think it would help the public as well, visually. Second is I would love to see a list of pros and cons for the different options. And um, maybe I missed it in the packet. Um, but I would love to see, at least from the, from the staff's perspective, what are the pros and cons? Because this is an expertise that not all of us have, and it would be nice to sort of see what that is. Because then, then we could, we could provide feedback in terms of in terms of how values, you know, representing the values of the public in terms of those different pros and cons. Thank you. Um, I second Commissioner Jones' comment, and I can reiterate again the way in which information is presented to the public. Uh, but in in regards to the feedback, so when it comes to housing, um, as you may know. Um, I've been kind of in the housing space, so I see housing as a as a human right. And when it comes to the growth and the changes that we're seeing globally in terms of population and the economy is changing, and uh, we do see the young house crisis that we have. And it is always I always think about the um, the fact that we do want to help as a society, and we have our values as long as they don't impact me, so they're not in my backyard. And I say that as someone who moved from Bothell, being from big cities, I appreciate my backyard. I definitely appreciate the suburban feel. And then I also realize that in order for me to just really share some of the the beautiful life that I have, it does really take under consideration making sure that things are changing. So if if we do need to uh, provide more housing and there are these targets that have been set to make sure that we can be a city for all, uh, my I'm leaning towards the, definitely supporting the, the, the cities that support that. And I am, um, when it comes to the planning and developing, it's all about the how we do it, right? but really having the opportunity to make it easier to do it is something that I'm leaning for. And I just want to stress how important it is to really have renderings and visuals in terms of who really benefits because we have this uh, fear of the other. So when it comes to who who is going to be coming here, um, I, I just really want to remind all of us that Things are changing and we're not scary as you're moving into a new place. And I, I want to make sure that we have the homes to support the growth that we're experiencing in this beautiful city. Thank you. Other commissioner comments, questions? Seeing none. So this is a tough one. This is the big one, I guess. And Commissioner Westerbeck did indicate some uh, challenges in achieving some of these densities. So um, I'm not sure where you go with that. I, I will submit just a couple more things. Um, you, you don't have to necessarily do everything I, I recommend. Like, there can be half measures or something. But I feel like it's the elephant in the room in, in countless cities around North America. Because there's sort of it's basic list of things that is written about over and over and over and over now, whether that's the APA or, you know, Congress on Urbanism or, or um, you know, any, any group of planners getting together these days and talking and writing articles and stuff. These things come up over and over and over again. So I, I, I bet you see them in your work. I, I don't want to assume you don't know all this already. So, because you're professionals, but um, anyway, I just think it's the, it's Bothell's turn to start wrestling with some of this because um, developers will, 
we'll, we'll build really pretty nice, nice homes um, at a pretty decent grade. Um, some people probably call them luxury, but they'd be just, you know, your, your average apartment or townhouse or whatever. Um, and you'd get, you'd generally get a lot more of them if you just, uh, you know, maybe it's a three foot setback instead of a five or something. Setbacks always frustrating to me also. I'll just, one more thing, because um, uh, the building code covers building to building distances just fine. It really doesn't need to be in the zoning code. It's really, you know, it's a, it's a vibes thing and it's a don't get too close to me and uh, but there's there's no reason someone couldn't just put up a wall as close as they want and make it a three hour fire rating, whatever is required. It's not going to have windows or something might not be as pleasant, but it really should be up to that person to decide. Um, OK, I'm going to put it at three feet and I can only have, you know, 20 or 25 percent openings. This is building code stuff. Right. So um, we dictate it and we also do it for stormwater. But our our engineers are really talented and clever now. They can find ways to either, like I'm on the Horse Creek system, so you can just dump it all right in there and you pay a fee for it whether you use it or not, so you might as well use it. Um, but there's all kinds of wonderful, wonderful solutions. And, you know, cities all over the world figure out how to deal with stormwater with a lot more lot coverage than, than we're allowing. So, anyway, I think we just make our own roadblocks. Thanks. Okay. We can uh, we can definitely bring back some, some examples of what, what these densities or... or something similar would look like, just so you, you have that perspective uh, for the 16th, uh, making sure that we can kind of continue moving moving forward on these. Mr. Lever. Thank you. I have another comment. When it comes to the supporting housing and the low-income housing, the other thing that will be helpful for us to um, really just kind of have is the type of partnerships that the city of Bothell we have with the entities that provide assistance for low-income housing and supportive housing. Because when it comes to the services that are required to really support the families who might be in one of those units, I think there's a lot of fear on having someone who may have the need, and then this idea that no one else will be there to support us. And I really think this is the point where we need to be talking to the um, housing, the King County Housing Authority, like King County, and really having them at the table at this stage, just to make sure that as we look at the different scenarios, there is more of a realistic approach to what is doable. Because the other thing that sometimes may happen is we do think that things can happen if we just provide the regulation and then we don't have the resources and then at the end of the day it does turn into the worst nightmare. So if not already, which I'm sure you are, like I will really be interested in understanding where are these entities, the Department of Housing and Urban Development as well, in terms of looking whether or not there will be any federal funds to support what we know we want to provide in our city. And, and as part of the Housing Action Plan, which will begin towards the end of this year and into next year, that's where we're going to look at the how do we how do we establish affordable units, you know, required units, um, and support those that are living in them. So that's where we're starting to to look at our engagement, how to how to guide that that project, and who to involve, um, which is a, a large a large group. Um, at this point. So, more to come on that. Other comments? So, uh, yeah, please. So, Commissioner Jones, if since you're going to bring material, more, some more materials back um, so we can revisit this on October 16th, I, w I think it might be useful to also look at where we already have open public spaces in the areas that we're talking about where the zoning is, you know, where we're considering these changes in those zoning areas. And I say that because one of, since what's most likely going to happen is in these denser areas, they will be attractive to folks, and then we want this. We, we want this to be attractive to folks who are probably on the lower, a lower income level than maybe some of the suburban housing that's there. I mean, that's part of it, right, is we have these goals for these different things. But we know that part of environmental justice is also making sure that folks have access to amenities as well. It's not just the harms, but it's the benefits. And parks and open spaces and recreation areas 
are part of those benefits. So I don't know if it's possible to show some of that as well as we consider what these areas might look like if we were going to go to such a dense. We need to increase density. I'm totally supportive of that. But I want to understand what that means for the people who are going to be living there. Yeah, the, the commission spent a considerable amount of time on open public space a little while ago before many of the current commissioners were there, were here. And I think you'd be surprised at what some of the things are that are open public space. For instance, you know, the Six Oaks development, those trees are open public space. Just one example I'll give you. <laughs> Any other comments? So, so I guess I'd say the commission has generally been supportive of, well, I'd say more than generally, has been supportive of increasing density. But I, I hear a lot of questions about what does it mean. So maybe you can help us visualize it a little bit sure, so we can sure. weigh in. And, and, and I just want to clarify, our focus is on what that minimum is going to be set at. Yes. It's already... We baked it in um, for the maximum, um, yes. but it's just really what that minimum might look like, uh, and I'd say initially. So, yeah. And there are. I'm going to go through other other aspects of these these draft amendments um, in a second here that that might answer a few questions um, that were in the materials. Okay. Thank you. Proceed. Yeah. All right. Wait, Commissioner Lever. I actually just thought of another thing, if possible, for next time when we think about changing um, the um, the changes that are going to be made to the plan. I don't know if this is doable, right? But understanding if I am in a single family home, residential one, and it's changing, we still go through a process, right? And I don't necessarily think, I think it might be easier if we can just point out to what that process looked like to remove the fear. So trying to figure out the process of what it means to have a zoning change if you're already within your residential one or you want to change the use, this is not this is not going to change it immediately for your home. And I think that will really help uh, increase awareness of what the process entails and all the regulations that come into play to make sure that we understand that this is just kind of like allows us to do things, to imagine, but actually doing it has its own process. and. When I think about maybe conversations that I've been having, and then there's that fear of like, oh, it's changing to to be able to eloquently say, well, no, you still go through X, Y, C, W, and I don't know if, if that can be produced by the next the next meeting, so that that we can have that talking point and support the reasons why we supported the increase in city. Are, are you asking about how a a site would go about redeveloping? with the, the zone change. So say there's an existing single residence in a higher density zone. Um, yeah, they, they would go through just a, a development a development project permit. Um, there's no platting, there's no there's no you know, extensive review. Part of what what the code is is doing is it's it's making Eliminating potential barriers through by by not requiring land use uh, steps to take place. So, identifying you could you could build within this range of of units with this lot. Um, but, but I think we've had conversations around the different reviews that there are things that we will that the city will continue to make sure that can be built. Like even if it's the zoning, but you are looking at the order overflow or whether or not is meeting the environmental requirements. I mean, there are different layers to really protect our um, city in different ways. And I'm not necessarily sure that's been simplified in a way that can be explained to others to mitigate that fear of all of a sudden we're going to have someone who is coming in irresponsible and then just building a, 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 a um, dense story building without really going through a, a thorough process, like it's eliminating that barrier for you to go in and do everything that you have to do to make it happen. But there's still a lot of steps that go into that, that I don't necessarily think the general public understands. And if you're not a developer, then you really don't understand them. And then here we are again with that fear component. When we don't understand, we fear. So. Commissioner Westerbeck. May I just make one comment? Um, and it pertains to this. Um, there were three reports 
uh, that the city um, commissioned spring of, was it 22, Kevin, when they did the middle housing outreach? And um, Burke might have been working on the comprehensive plan by then. You weren't here yet, Christian. One was on equity. One was analysis, I think, of the zoning code. One was an analysis of how the missing middle or the middle housing code that we had written <clears throat> would affect the city. And that was the one I'm thinking of. I probably got it on my computer. Um, and you guys might have already reviewed it. Um, but they did an analysis of how quickly um, they think that it would affect neighborhoods and the percentage of units that would change on a in a neighborhood and stuff. So there's actually data on that that we commissioned. I can't remember if Burke, I think someone else did it. Or did you guys do it for us? Um, I think this is OTAC and Eco Northwest yes, uh, market yeah. analysis and feasibility assessment. Yeah. So, sure. so they've got data in there about, and it was really, it was like, this is the minimum we think it will change, you know, 5%, whatever of housing stock. And the maximum was like 9 or 10 or something like that. It was a range based on other cities and experiences. So I, I don't know that, that, it, pertains to your question exactly, but I always thought it was a uh, really important data that I wanted more people to understand. I was encouraging people to read the report because it could, I think, talk some people off the edge of the cliff a little bit. So if they understood most cities where this is happening or now, you know, into it a ways are only seeing five to 10% of their housing stock change because it is a huge undertaking to say, I'm going to tear down this house and put up something else entirely. So. Um, I don't know. That's something I don't want you guys to have to go re recreate the wheel and this data is probably on the shelf for you. So if it's useful. Other commissioner comments. So I, I guess to restate some of this, this change wouldn't require that neighborhoods be redeveloped to these standards. So if I sold my house and someone wanted to buy my house and buy it as is, it would stay single-family house within the lot that it's in. If someone wanted to buy my property and tear down my house, then it would speak to what the new development would be. But it doesn't require a change of the existing. Right, right. And that's, and that's where that minimum question came in. Mm -hmm. If the minimum density on, on a lot that just didn't seem feasible, um, you know, or are we going to require a project to build at the high at the 25 units per acre um, it sounds like from Commissioner Westerbeck it's possible it's it's doable to even go up to the 50 as long as the the remaining development regulations around setbacks and, and a couple of things I'll get into here in a second um, provide for that and and we do have review we do have items on the future horizon around parking um and we can definitely i can definitely respond back to what the open space would look like and then providing some examples of what some 25 units per acre versus 50 units per acre examples might be or something around around that realm um and try to give apples to apples comparisons at least massing and and type um but there are there there are, to speak to the development standard um, process. There there are many layers, not just within community development that that are part of a of a project. So stormwater review, um, what the right of way looks like. Um, there's tree retention. We'll be getting into our urban forestry master plan. What what canopy growth would need to look like, um, even on lots that might only have enough room for one one tree. Um, so there's, there's a lot of layers and, and then not, not even to mention steep slopes and streams and wetlands and all the review that goes in there. So we're, so when we are talking about these densities, minimum, maximum, whatever, is that based on developable acreage or total acreage? So if you do have the setbacks from wetlands or streams. It would be based, for for that type of situation. It'd be based on the the buildable area, um, but an unencumbered lot. We'd be looking at the yes. the full okay site boundaries. I think that's important to note as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Any other Commissioner Westerman? I know I've been talking a lot. I also want to be my own contrarian and say, I don't think um, going to the twenty five thirty forty mac um, minimum is necessary necessarily the the absolute like must have you'd think I would say that but I'm more concerned that someone has the max that they could do the max if they wanted to 
to build for the most, the highest and best use and most good. If someone only wants to hit minimum, you know, they want to do that. Um, I would say we'd want a certain minimum density, but there was, whether it has to be 25, 30, and 40, I don't know that I, you know, personally as a commissioner feel that's an absolute pound my fist on the table requirement. Um, like I said, I'm just more concerned with people who want to, um, like me, often just make better use of the land. It kind of kind of kills you if you're a few blocks from transit or stores or something like that. You can only put two two dwellings up when you when it could support twelve or something like that. So that's more of my concern. And when I when I make these comments, so thanks, Mr. Lever. Your comment just prompted a question for me, so that's great. Uh, so for the. I thought I heard you say too that this is what it will be required to meet the targets. So assuming that we we can't really control whether uh, everyone will build at the highest density by requiring these minimums, then we know that we will hit the targets. Is that right? No. The, okay. In order to hit the targets, we'd have to build to the maximum density. So the higher column, 50, 60, 80. Yeah, it's pretty good to come and say I didn't realize that when you said that what you were saying. Yeah. So based on the assumptions, the assumed redevelopment rate, kind of available land, age of existing, you know, residential sites, if we and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse, at any any moment, but if we follow that that assumed redevelopment over the next twenty years and we build it to the maximum base density units per acre, we will achieve those targets. If someone builds, if everyone built to the drafted 25 units per acre in an RM2, then we would be behind. That's what that five-year check-in in 2029 is going to show us is, okay, City of Bothell, you put in this minimum density of 25 units per acre for RM2. Everybody built to that for one reason or another. Now you need to ratchet it up. Guess, I mean, who knows what will happen, but that's if we follow what that assumed redevelopment pace would be. Do I have that right? Yeah, I think that's generally right. Um, the piece I wanted to point out, too, is that your future land use map could give you more oper you could create more capacity with additional rezones beyond what kind of this does so you still the future land use map gives you more capacity than you need to met, meet the targets this is kind of the like these these proposed maximums would get you there but just there so you could go further if at five years you are not on track to hit those targets there's there's play within the what the future land use map would, um, the the corresponding zones that would go with those land use designations. So you could start uh, essentially up zoning in some areas to help encourage more development or make changes, additional changes to the regulations. Mr. Lever. Thank you. So, if if going back to the beginning of the meeting and reading the memo so there's been a thorough review and calculations and just a lot of work that you've done to really come with this recommendation in terms of we think this is this is the best uh, proposal to achieve our goals and to allow for some wiggle room to the developers is that sort of is that a true statement and if so when it comes to getting our feedback be, because we've we've already gone through a very uh, um, yeah, I guess like thorough process, there's no alternative to this one. So it's more so how do we then make sure that we understand where we're heading and then mitigate any any negative impacts by doing it or it's right because we're, we're moving forward. So I just want to make sure that the feedback that I provide or what you're seeking from me is really informing your next steps. So yeah, the, the feedback we're looking for is on the on that that minimum do we do we create the range and, and kind of hope that development will lean towards the maximum but it provides that flexibility it eliminates some of the concern about smaller lots that may be you know may be really difficult to build because they're middle of the block they've got you know they've got 
setbacks to think about and, and and the shape of it. So all of the all of the factors that anyone looking to redevelop may be considering. And again, that's where more time could come in handy to say, well, let's think about a scaling. Um, the, the, the proposed minimum was just half of set at 50% of what the max is. Um, so, and, and, we, and we typically see in, in this, this world is in the, the community development world that you know, development wants to, to develop, you know, can, can, I, can I build another floor? Can I build a few more units? Can I, you know, and, and so we're, we're thinking they're gonna lean towards that maximum. It's just how much flexibility do we want to build into, into the code at this point? and be able to come back and pivot as we need to with either more capacity in the tank because we have areas that we could change the zoning to, um, or we look to say, well, we need to raise that minimum, um, but it's just never been tested, so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, well, so this is helpful because when it comes to planning and not really having all the time to recreate the scenarios and do the calculations, then this is the best, which is, I mean, I don't even want to say it, but it's sometimes like our best guess, which is fine. And I've seen it happening in my previous, well, I mean, I'm in government, right? So sometimes it's like, well, we don't have the time of the resources. So I, I do then want to see if it's possible for the next uh, meeting, if we can really talk about the resources that we have to really track progress. Because when I think about the five years, and again, if I am ha happen to be, um, sitting right next to the lot that developed to the to those maximum standards i if i don't understand what's happening and for whatever reason i'm not engaged i this is not going to be it's not going to be fun and there's going to be a lot of uh, pushback in anything that we try to do 5 years from now so if you can help us understand how we're going to be tracking what is happening and the response that we're getting from the developers that will be super helpful so that by the time we hit that year five, we're not surprised, and then we're really having that feedback loop in a way that is meaningful for the community as well. Yes, and, and part of the implementation plan is to to develop that tracking that tracking mechanism, um, and 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 I do want to make sure that you know, the RM four, which was the twenty eight hundred um, existing twenty eight hundred uh, residential zone. They're not they're not extensive. So you know the, the majority of the city that was lower density, seventy two hundred up to ninety six hundred square foot, those are still on that that the higher portion of this table, the lower density um, that can already do middle housing with you know a number of um, of units and accessory dwelling units, um, and these are focused around the down the, the perimeter of the downtown. Uh, in a few other spaces. So it's not large swaths of, of the city um, going to that. Commissioner Robson. Thank you. Um, I think that um, I would go with the lower option, the 8, the 10, and the 15, leaving that um, on the table. Um, I agree that probably most developers are going to try to build as much as they can on a lot, but I like that idea of giving them the flexibility. And since we have the the five year check in, um, if it does turn out that people are you know not um, creating that high density, we can shift it around. But I like leaving it open um, just in case there are difficult lots to develop on and be able to um, have that flexibility to utilize um, maybe. Mm, less than ideal lots. That's what I got for you. Commissioner Jones. So it's Commissioner Jones. So I want to refine my request a bit for the next meeting because now I understand things a little bit better and 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 others may still want the additional information. But but given that you said that the only way to meet the targets is if we hit the max. I, I think I heard that correctly. That's correct. I don't actually need to see illustrations of what the minimum might look like because really we need folks to get to the max. But I, some of the discussion that's coming up here has to do with those benefits, those pros and cons of those two alternatives. And what I do want to see is a more thorough list of pros and cons. I don't want it just because 
someone asked a question, so now we're hearing a pro or a con. I would like a thorough analysis of pros and cons. I realize some of this, there's a lot of uncertainty about. I mean, I would imagine that one potential issue to look at would be um, if we know we need to be at the max base density, is it more likely for us to get there if we go with option one versus option two? You don't have a crystal ball. You can't predict that. But there must be some way to give an educated guess about that. Um, but on the other hand, this, you know, I'm hearing, and I totally agree with that as well, well, maybe we could just see if naturally this will get there in five years, and then at the check-in we have flexibility um, because, you know, there might be some thoughts that really you don't want to do X or Y with. Um, I think the affordability piece is another piece of this, right? Because um, at the five-year check-in, we're going to also want to see if we're hitting the affordability targets, not just the numbers. Um, so I, that's, that's, I, I'm hearing some pros and cons, but I don't know if I'm hearing a thorough list of pros and cons. And so that's more important to me than necessarily seeing what the minimum might look like, because actually that's not what we want. We want the maximum. Mr. Westerbeck. I always want to speak to that. I, I sounds like I did hear you correctly when you said that earlier. I thought it was actually a misspoke or I misheard. So when you said that we really do need to hit the, the maximum numbers. So it begs the question, why aren't we just imposing the maximum? <laughs> and and I thought actually Commissioner Robson made a lot of sense when she said, you know, given that flexibility, you, you may have a difficult, you know, it's a triangle shaped lot or it's steep slope or something. But I imagine there's some director's rules and maybe that could apply to, hey, there, no matter what we do, we're never going to get 25 out of this because it's a weird shape or something. I don't know. We'd have to cross that bridge and come to it. But so it makes me think like maybe we do need the, the proposed minimum density because that's sort of a, why is it even there if we're not even going to hit the, the target? If if the maximum, I mean, I feel like anybody would be asking that question, like well, if, if we have to hit the max, and I understand it's probably nuanced because you're, like you said, um, there's going to be development in other areas of the city, then I guess those numbers will contribute. But um, so I'm, I'm kind of back on the, well, maybe we do need a minimum density just to make sure we're not squandering land and someone doesn't decide to just put a, a palatial house a block from Main Street when they really should have 10 of them or something. So I'm back on option one is the minimum. <laughs> Maybe not so much the 8, 10, 15 after all. Thanks. Mr. Lieber. And I don't think I was clear on the option that I prefer when I said the maximum density. So I'm definitely the option one, just knowing of the housing crisis that we're in and also knowing that we just don't know what the economy would look like. And if we do have a window of opportunity to create more housing opportunities, we don't want to create a barrier that will prevent us from capitalizing on any resources that may come our way. So I'm leaning towards option one. Commissioner comments? So I want to raise a different concern, and that goes to the five-year check-in. Uh, this is a pretty big change you know, allowing five, six times as many units per acre as current. So, and this is going to be effective early next year? Yes. So, I might look over to Commissioner Westerbeck, but <laughs> within, so all of a sudden developers have this completely different, you know, sandbox to play in, and they got to rethink how they're going to do this. They're going to have to develop the designs. They're going to have to make the permits, Submittals, going to get the approvals. I wonder how much change you'll see in five years. Lay on top of that, the economy is cyclical. There's going to be a you know drop off in building at some point, and you know it's going to go up again at some point. If we happen to have a drop during that five years, I wonder if you'll have enough data. It just seems like it's a short time frame to get feedback on a change of this magnitude. And I don't know what you can do about that. It's an observation as much as anything. Yeah, I mean, anecdotally, I could say we, we implemented the middle housing code back in March, um, and we're, we're now just starting to see, you know, more pre-application meetings, those preliminary meetings where, where uh, a developer, resident, owner of a property come in and want to see what they can do. Um, so there's definitely a lag. Um, 
you know, we, there's a lot of individuals paying attention to this. You know, master builders, they've been watching every comprehensive plan go, go through, so they're, they're aware of what's, what's coming, but then it makes them, yes, recalculate what type of product that they'd be looking to, to produce. And so we would anticipate a lag of, you know, a few to six to 12 months um, to really see things start to, to, to come in. But even that has its own, you know, process, you know, whether just the building permit review process can take a few months uh, at its, at its quickest. Um, so yeah, we're looking at a couple years before we'd start to see development, you know, out of the ground uh, popping up. And that, that's if land is ready to go and, and, and all those things. I was going to say, so, yes, <laughs> predicated on the availability of the land for yes. that too. Um, so, you know, fingers crossed there's no, there's no issues uh, economically uh, out there as well. So it, it's five years is going to be about when we'd, we'd start to see things actually happening and at least in the pipeline. So we would know what is, what is coming. It's not going to be, oh, there's been 50 projects that have been built out and the city's changed dramatically in five years it's it's going to be you know hopefully progressively moving forward a lot of a lot of what we do is just long term it's 20 years 20 years um so yeah okay thank you Commissioner Lever. thank you so i just um want to second or really uh, i'm interested in the impact analysis the pros and cons and as part of that if you could incorporate sort of like the competitive advantage like what's happening in the cities in our neighboring cities, and many of them are going to their own comprehensive plan. So what happens if we don't allow for these changes or if we go with the, not the option one, right? And then what are we gonna be sort of losing to the city next to us? If you can please do that, thank you. Okay, other commissioner comments looking around? Mr. Westerbeck. Sorry, I've been talking a lot. One thing just to, to uh, add on to your, maybe to, to answer a question you didn't ask, but it's related to what you asked, um, Chair Kiernan. Um, the, and it really reflects on my very first comment. Um, the governors for how much development can happen on these sites are really going to be things that aren't the unit, the unit count. It's going to really be parking, period. Every development project, um, this is my architect hat on, um, we always have to start every project with how much can you, can you park? At once you draw on the side setbacks and figure out how much lot you have to work with, then you figure out how much you can park and how they have to come and go, and it gobbles up pretty much the entire ground plane. And so a lot of lots where, um, like I'm what I'm working on now, um, we could have put nine or ten units easily, but we couldn't fit that many cars. In fact, we could have done 12, but we couldn't fit that many cars. We could fit about seven or eight. And that would have taken up the entire ground, ground plane, which also then it's just all got cars on, underneath, which is not a great thing to walk by as on the streetscape or for the neighbors. Um, so anyway, it's cars once again, but I just wanted to let you know that that's going to be the, the first challenge they, they get to deal with is, and, and so stormwater, setbacks, cars, um, maybe height limits, those are going to be the governors, are going to be the, the things that keep the, the probably uh, keep a lot of developers from hitting sometimes even the minimums. Okay, any other comments? Commissioner Gustafson. Hi, Sarah Gustafson here. Great discussion. I am very much struck by Commissioner Westerbeck's statement that we might not be able to hit minimums because of parking requirements and other parking mandates and other things that might shrink the buildable land. So if that is the case, are we setting ourselves up for a conflict because the current restrictions will make it impossible to build the minimums? And that seems like we should reconcile that before moving forward. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. I've got other other slides to run through. Um, okay. I think, I, I think I've got what I need. I think Sorry. I've got what I need to, to come back next time um, right. on just the density. Um, a couple other things. There. A couple other uh, items to run through. Um, maybe equally as 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 complicated uh, within within the packet, the proposed height based on uh, and and current height, um, bumping them up slightly for the majority of these 
uh, and then going up to, to 45 or 55 within the, the RM3 or 4. So um, trying to ac accommodate for, for what those densities uh, would need. Uh, we do a we do list out in our code a building coverage and then a hard surface coverage. So total site coverage is the 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 one on the right of each of these columns. Uh, so the proposed bump those up as well. Um, understandably, for total hard surface coverage in the RM4, the the highest density residential zone um, below the RAC is you know pushing up to ninety percent. Know, accommodating for that um, so this just illustrates those and make sure there's no, no questions on, on these we do have, we do have another uh, section that's being uh, eliminated from the from the calculation which is the um, the removal of the accessory building coverage so we, we kind of have that in there as a as a secondary um, percentage for accessory buildings um, which was at 5%, so that is basically just added into these. I'll dive in as usual, if that's okay, Commissioner Westerbeck. Again, this is the stuff I stare at all day. Um, I, I, I like seeing this. In fact, I had to double check, like, oh, we really get to go higher in uh, RM2, 3, and 4? Yay, all right. And actually, all of them, 35. And actually, um, a majority of cities I used to, were do projects in had a 35 foot height limit, and 30 seems to be a lot more common now. And I don't know if that's just Bothell or what, or people or cities are kind of clamping down. Or, or and sometimes it was like in Seattle, it was 30 for for uh, shed roofs and flat roofs, and you could go 35. I think they still have that if you, if you do a pitch over three and 12 or something like that. And I know you've addressed some of that in the the packet, the the four and 12 issue. But anyway, this is great. I'm glad to see this because. Um, uh, we're getting back as far as like trends and building and stuff. We were seeing more nine, ten foot ceilings, which are really livable size um, heights for smaller spaces. As we go to smaller apartments and smaller homes, a nine, ten foot ceiling feels great. You can do more with it. It's more humane. It's a great living space. And so I found that 35 is a sweet spot if you want to go full three stories and you want to give someone a slightly higher um, ceiling height, or um, you've got a weird site when it slopes a lot and um, you know, you've got a, uh, an average grade that maybe works against you for uh, heights, whatever. So anyway, I applaud this. This is great. I always like to see more um, building coverage, hard surface coverage. I'm glad to see that go up. Um, we could do quite a bit with, with the bump up. So that's great. Um, so overall, I mean, it's great. I'm, I applaud the, the uh, improvements. Other commissioners? Commissioner Jones? So this is Commissioner Jones. I, I assume that we have to do this, right? The, the, there's a need to scale up where, you know, how much building footprint could, could, could be installed. I should say, though, that with lot coverage, hard surface coverage, there are still those stormwater requirements to meet, you know. So you, even if it might be 90% coverage, they have to establish their, their stormwater compliance so uh, so it seems to me that we have to do this and we know that we have really good um, building permit process etc that covers all of those things so it looks fine to me other commissioners do hard surfaces include permeable surfaces like permeable concrete or other alternatives which do allow some infiltration off the top of my head, I'm not sure how we how we calculate those if we if we give them a credit. Uh, I believe they are. It's 50% usually for like perme permeable uh, paper, papers, I think, because I looked looked at that recently. Don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure it's 50%. I can I can be sure to to circle back on that one. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to like be a Mr. Know It All, but <laughs> I'm reading this stuff lots these days. So, um, and we just have we're dealing with that in our current project, and we're going to put in. An, permeable asphalt or concrete and uh, the code if I'm not mistaken says it's 50% uh, calculation thank you I apologize can you hand me one of the extra um, printouts my computer has decided to die I don't know. thank you 
All right, other commissioner comments, questions? Seeing none, uh, you wanna proceed? Sure. Uh, the next is the front and side, and I've got the, the rear set back on the next slide. So this shifts it a little bit. Um, and we did, so I'm gonna run, run through this real quick. So the proposed drops, the, the, the front yard setback, we added in um, on, so this is off of page 355 of the packet. So the, the minimum front yard setback and then a, so we've got the garage doors and then all others. So we established sort of two planes to look at. Um, and most cities have, have these, these standards where you, you've got to accommodate for a, a vehicle anyway that needs to fit in a, in a driveway if it is front loaded. Um, but the a forward portion of the home could project. So these front yard setbacks are for the, the structure, the main structure itself. They all have associated um, garage door setbacks, which follow the 20. So the proposed, I should have put a 20 next to all of these in the first column on the left, but they'd all still have that, that 20 foot setback because you need that space for a vehicle to, to fit if that's, if that's the, the layout of, a, um, of, the, of the site. So it's, it's shrinking that a little bit, giving some flexibility and in, in pulling a home forward. It creates space for a detached ADU potentially on, on the lower density uh, sites, creates some, some flexibility for how to, to bring a building uh, more, more proud to the street. Uh, and then the sides shifted to fives. Uh, currently it's a five foot minimum, but they combine to equal 15. So you might have five on one side, 10 on the other, um, but just shifting that you, you know, across the board to, to five feet total. Uh, and then the, the rear setbacks broke it apart uh, to look at if there was no alley, if there was an alley, or if there's an alley with the garage doors facing that alley. So if, if you know, structure could go up to the alley, if there were no garage doors, if you had garage doors where you would enter in directly, so the doors are parallel to the alleyway, you'd have a, a three foot setback from that, allowing for ingress and egress. Um, if there's no alley, they, you know, that's the looking at sort of the, the right and the left column current on the right proposed on the far left. Um, so shrinking those down quite a bit, um, providing some of that flexibility, which accommodates for, and, and most of the lower density zones, could you fit a detached ADU back there um, or do you know, use the, the middle housing provisions? So establishing some of those flexibilities and that paired with the, the hard surface building coverage and the densities kind of blending them all together. I see some head nodding. Commissioner Westerbeck, again, fantastic. I was reading this earlier before I came and, and I was like, again, double take. Really? Am I seeing this? This is great. This will really help housing get built. For real. This will, will actually move the needle. So I appreciate that. Um, and um, yeah, the, the current ones are, they're pretty big. Um, so getting down to 10 and 15, it's very reasonable. Um, and uh, yeah, combined with the, uh, the additional structural coverage, this is gonna make a big difference. So uh, it's, it's getting closer to, again, I think really making a difference after these are codified. I feel like I had another point and I forgot, so I'll wait until others come in. Other commissioner comments or questions? So is it fair to assume you've done some level of modeling that would show with these changes we'll be able to achieve the goals? Yes, that is, these were part of the kind of um, the, the density, the units per lot and the, all of that is one, excuse me, one package. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. I, I thought so, but I mm -hmm. wanted to get that on the record. Commissioner Jones. This is Commissioner Jones. Just one last uh, comment, if it's useful or not, um, is when we think about that five-year check-in point, it might be good to include as part of the formal uh, check-in process to survey developers in the area, not only the ones who, are, who, have, who have been developing, but those who have chosen not to, um, to find out if some of these need to be revised 
at some point. So it's great. These changes are great. Question is, do we need to make even more changes um, to allow us to get to where we need to be? Um, and hearing from the developers might be good, just as it's important to hear t from the public in terms of what their experience is as well. So. Just a quick comment, because you might they might say, well, this is way better, but interest rates are still killing us. And we can't get anything built because of that, because that's kind of where we're at right now uh, for rental projects. That's where we're seeing more for sale. So just a little bit of market snapshot. So it could be like, oh, yeah, you know, this is great. We love it, but I can't do anything with it yet. But hopefully they won't say that. Okay. Other commissioners? All right. So you got a All right. yes on that. Um, another thing that we're looking to do, and this is a bit of the time crunch. So part of our, our zoning map, I call it a bit of an alphabet soup. There's a lot of overlays, uh, various zones that kind of have these, there's, there's, there's your underlying zoning, there are um, sub-area standards. What we're looking to do as, as sort of a step one is to create these overlays that we initially thought they could replace some of some of that alphabet soup and, and align really closely with the the naming convention of the future land use map, which is on the next slide. And I'll, I'll, I'll toggle back and forth between this because it might be helpful. Um, so right now, given time, we're looking to add this as an overlay update to, um, it's in the packet, it's on page, page 350, it's the last page, 357. Um, and adding this to the commercial and industrial dimensional standards. So right now there's the, um, it's the OP and B L I. There's a few others, a few other uh, existing uh, that that are there. We're looking to add these in there. These these will allow some um, some clarity. And then our step two would be to wrap these in as zones and then re sort of peel back the the other layer um, as part of phase two next year um, with with just some other general code cleanup items um, so within these they've they've established a proposed height and a proposed FAR these are part of what was the center's alternative so if you think back to we had the neighborhood and then the center's alternative these were these were parts of the center's alternatives and the options for how much height, how much, how much floor area ratio uh, do we want to look to go to. Um, so finding a way to incorporate that into the code to allow us the density uh, to achieve our targets, uh, this was the, this is the initial step. Um, I'd love another six months. My gosh, I keep saying that. Uh, but we'll get there uh, as, as a, just a general zone cleanup. And, and my mission is to, to make it as clean and clear and predictable as possible. Uh, and so the proposed heights here, um, the, it, it really does depend. So the second column, the current height, it depends on where you are. So if you are in a mixed use N, C, or E, and you've got a 60, 60, or 85 foot new proposed height, your height still may be greater. You could be in an area that already has a height maximum that goes up to 150. So the greater will always apply. So it really is dependent upon where, where you're located. Everyone's eyes are probably focused on the, the MUE and 85 feet. That's the deepest purple. So on the map, the deepest purple, you think about North Creek, think about Canyon Park, those already have areas that can go up to 150 feet. Um, so there are some areas that that don't have that existing up to 100, 150 feet. They're somewhere in that range of 35 to 150. So it is really dependent on where it's where it's located, and it, and it adds to that complexity. Part of next year will be to clarify it. So hopefully we just have a zoning table that says, here's your maximum height. Here's the zone you're in. There are no overlays. You might be in a sub area, which has its special regulations in it, but you've got your zoning. Uh, and the same thing for FAR. So they, the current FAR might be equal to or greater than the proposed. 
uh, but these were just being pulled directly from that center's the, the portion of the center's alternative that was wrapped into the preferred the preferred alternative. Questions or comments? Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Jones, I just want to thank staff for this. I mean, I know you probably wanted six more months to sort of think through and model and do all those things. But uh, but this is the result of the hybrid alternative. And so, yay. I mean, I, I like this. I think this is great. General approval. All right. Moving on. Uh, I think this might be my last slide. So there were a few other changes I just wanted to note. So we, we removed the, the minimum circle lot diameter, um, basically the minimum circle you had to have to establish a lot. Uh, we added the unit lot subdivision uh, requirement. Uh, we're, we're toying with the idea. So right now we have a, an offspring subdivision and now we have a unit lot subdivision. We're, we're looking at, could we just replace it? Uh, what does that do? Um, they're a little bit repetitive, um, but the unit lot subdivision creates the ability to um, establish underlying lots for ADUs that are not gonna follow your standard lot layout. So you've got a single family home and a attached ADU and a detached ADU, or you have a duplex and a, and a detached ADU, you can set those boundary lines um, according to kind of where the footprint of the of the structure would be they don't have to follow standard dimensions and it creates a sort of a micro um, subdivision and it's got it, it, it has a lot of flexibilities more so than the offspring lot uh, we added a few definitions around um, emergency um, amendment and we we updated a few of them around around housing the permanent supportive housing, emergency housing, and transitional housing. Uh, we did make the edit to the Midtown sub area and took the, the input from the community uh, well before I, I arrived, but Midtown seemed to be the way that all the, what the community wanted it to be, so that's the, the edit that we've got in there. Uh, we are amending some of the impact fees to scale them to ADUs as we have to, so they're not the same as a, a detached individual single family home, They're, they are scalable. Uh, there are, there, there currently is a, I think the park impact fee does have a scaling sort of approach to a 500 square foot unit or a five to a thousand square foot. Um, so we'll be, we'll be going through that exercise and then uh, conversations around a neighborhood scale retail. So the corner store uh, approach um, and we're looking to establish a definition how do we make sure that they are allowed yet not impacting the, the the density goals that we're trying to achieve that they can be integrated into the existing uh, community and uh, al align a lot a lot with the the home occupation standards so looking to maybe nest it within the home occupation standards uh, as far as what what regulations might might make sense um, and looking to other cities around the region and the country that that seem to have some examples. So we'll have more on we'll more on that kind of what it looks like next time, uh, based on where we land. And that was my last slide. Commissioner Westerbeck. As usual, I have comments or also accolades. I, I pour, <coughs> poured over this earlier, and I was um, I wasn't sure I completely understood the ad laws added unit lot subdivision, but what I could gather from it, I was excited about it. And it sounds like I interpreted it about like you told me. And uh, I think that's going to be really helpful. I'm, I'm ha really happy to see it. all these are actually really great. Um, and then um, the uh, and the impact fees is, is great. Um, I think it said it can be more than a, a maximum of 50% of uh, the house, what the main house would cost or something like that. I saw some of that in the weeds there. Um, Happy to do away with the minimum lot circle diameter. I think it's a very suburban requirement. So bye bye. We can we can work with weird sites. Um, but I also wanted to bring up. I was watching the council meeting of the night, um, and the mayor brought up a good point. I've chatted with him about in the past, which was um, I'm also interested in in um, allowing the corner stores or the neighborhood retail um, anywhere because um, right now it's just RM only that we're proposing it. 
I know it was also kind of generically stated on page 243 in the pack packet. About, it, it, yeah, it, yeah, it was. And, and this is part of the, we're moving really quickly and trying to make yeah, sure of course. We're, we're responding yeah. as, as, as I just don't want to, because I was thinking of like, every now and then you go to some place, maybe it's more rural, and they've got like a, you know, a country cafe dinner thing, whatever, like at a house on a lot. And, uh, you know, someone with a 8,400 square foot lot, whatever it might be like, I'm going to do a little store and, and sell cool stuff I make. And then we're going to have like Friday night dinners or, you know, who, whatever the concept may be. It'd be really unfortunate to restrict someone because they have an 8,400 square foot lot or something like that from, from doing commerce where they might even have more space for doing something interesting. That's not necessarily the, the infill density corner store idea that I think a lot of us, including myself are thinking of. So anyway, just, well, I hate to put that constraint on us if we don't really need that constraint there. So maybe you're already at one step ahead, but I just wanted to, to get in a little, um, push for that, that we should just allow it citywide on residential. And, you know, could be certain occupancies and uses. I know we're going to go over that. Kind of has to be light impact, but uh, make it as, as widely available as possible. Commissioner Lieber. Thank you. I just want to thank the staff again for the work and then for what is worth. You know, I, I've been I'm working all day and then I feel I have no energy and I come here and I just feel like the energy is money. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so exciting. And I just really, really appreciate the work you do and I'm full of energy right now. So thank you. Other commissioners? Yeah, I, I want to uh, kind of follow on Commissioner Lever's comment and recognize the tremendous amount of work that's uh, been done by staff in a compressed time period. And we shouldn't forget the staffing challenges you've had uh, during this process. There's been, uh, I won't say almost, there's been 100% turnover in planning during this process. So uh, that had to have a lot of challenges of its own and you've managed to bring us a product that's exciting and interesting and so thank you for that hard work and we appreciate it. I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, <laughs> give credit to the, to the, the stable um, individual at the table who's always been around. Um, so much, much thanks to, to Burke for all the work that they've been putting in and continue to uh, on the project. So noted. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree with, with both commissioners. Just want to say this is a huge amount of work, just overwhelming, and I see it. And it takes me a while just to read it all, to know that someone authored all this and is evaluating it. And you've been there since day one. So <coughs> enormous thank you. All right, does that conclude this item? That concludes it for me. All right, great. Well, um, a lot of work, well done, so thank you. So moving on, our next item is reports from members. And do we have anything members would like to bring to the table? Looking around. Seeing none, okay, well. That's all right. We don't need to fill the time. <laughs> a report from staff. Anything for us? Uh, just a couple things. So we, we had a booth at the Sustainamania over the weekend, uh, well attended by staff. Uh, it's great to have a good new group that uh, we're all there and uh, helping out answering some great questions on, on the, the comprehensive plan, on the upcoming housing action, climate action plan. Uh, their urban forestry management plan, a little, little bit of everything, and, and downtown. So it was nice to to have uh, individuals coming to the to the booth, um, whether they realized it or not. I think they were coming to 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 find a scavenger hunt question or or answer to a question. Um, we didn't have it, but they thought we did. Um, Whatever so, it takes. <laughs> so, so that was that was good to see, uh, and and really good to engage. A uh, couple of upcoming events. So we do have the uh, October 16th Planning Commission meeting. Uh, I'm going to take this information into kind of how we how we approach it, uh, and then following that, we'll have the public hearing on November 6th. We are planning to to have an open house prior to that. We want to make sure we uh, create that opportunity for any direct questions from the community um, on something that we've we've been discussing, but want to make sure that they they understand. If, if they've got questions, so look for that on the, the next uh, the next uh, update. And that's it. All right, thank you. So there being no further business, is there a motion to adjourn? Mr. 
Commissioner Lieber. Commissioner Lieber. Uh, yes, motion to adjourn. All right. Is there a second? Commissioner Jones. This is Commissioner Jones, seconded. All right, all in favor of adjourn? Aye. 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 Uh, the meeting for is adjourned at 745. Our next meeting will be October 16th. Thank you all for your participation and attendance. Good night.